How to improve on classical guitar. That's what we're going to talk about today, and we're going to start right now. Uh, bear with my voice. It's a little off today, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, if you have questions, drop them in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and start with some questions that came in advance. Uh, one was the topic of harmonics. Uh, so how do you play a harmonic on the guitar? Well, uh, you can do natural harmonics, which is just uh, touching the string at a place where you're isolating uh, a partial of the harmonic series. You know, every time you play a vibrating string, there are a lot of different notes that are weakly sounding along with the fundamental note. Uh, so here's the fundamental E, but there's also this note and this note and this note that are weakly sounding along with it. So the most commonly used harmonics are to touch lightly at the 12th fret, the 7th fret, or the 5th fret um, to get those harmonics. And you're getting a note that's an octave higher, an octave and a fifth higher, or two octaves higher than the open string. Uh, you can also do artificial harmonics, which means you fret a note with the left hand and you're touching a note that's 12 frets higher um, and then plucking it as well with the right hand. And so in that case, you're getting a note that is an octave higher than the fundamental. So that's a little about harmonics. If you have more questions on harmonics, drop them in the chat. Um, another question that I got in advance was on effective use of the metronome. Uh, you know, how do you use uh, the metronome effectively? So I'm going to pull up a metronome on my phone and uh, just kind of demonstrate how I would go about uh, practicing with the metronome. I'm also going to keep an eye on the chat uh, so that as you have questions, I'll be able to answer those uh, as they come in. And thank you so much for being here today. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and um, show you kind of how I go about practicing with the metronome. And so uh, let's say I'm practicing a scale excerpt. So I would turn the metronome on. And I'm going to be listening to am I playing right with the metronome and just really trying to synchronize well. Whatever I'm practicing with the metronome, I'm going to generally uh, gradually work up the tempo. So let's say I'm very comfortable with the tempo I just played, which was 78. Uh, then I'm going to bump up the metronome slightly, maybe to like 84, and then uh, play it again. And you know, I'll keep doing this process, gradually increasing the tempo with the metronome. Let's say I got to a point where I really found that I was sticking and that it was difficult to play at that tempo. So I'm going to speed it up much, much faster. And let's just say for the sake of argument that that tempo was getting hard for me. Um, and that's a little under my limit, but let's just say that that was my limit of tempo. Then at that point, I might drop it back just slightly and practice under that uh, metronome marking and then work my way back up, uh, try it again at the sticking point. And if I wasn't sticking there anymore, then I'd try it a little bit faster. So that's a little bit about how I work with the metronome. Now I see Bluesy Blues Man dropped a question there in the chat. If you've reached a certain high tempo while playing a piece and this has become a plateau, how can we go uh, up to a higher tempo? Can you suggest a special working style for this? Yeah, absolutely, Bluesy. Good question. And what I would typically do is I would work right around that threshold. And there's really kind of three different techniques uh, that I would suggest with this. Um, definitely the core one is just to work right around that uh, threshold. And so again, if you're, uh, let's say, quarter equals 190 is your sticking point and you're playing eighth notes at 190. And uh, so, you know, you're just not able to get it any faster than that. If that's the case, what I do is I drop it right below that, like a 184 or something, and just practice a lot right below the sticking point. And, you know, as long as it's getting comfortable there, a little bit below that tempo, then I'm going to try it again at the tempo. And uh, if I am now able to play it at the sticking point, then I'll try bumping it up a little bit more. Um, you know, 
know, and if I'm able to keep going, great. Um, so that is kind of my core approach, but there's a couple other things I would suggest as well. You can also try speed bursts. Uh, in other words, slow notes with a little burst of quick notes. Uh, so let's say again, um, just for the sake of argument that playing eighth notes at 190 was my sticking point. Uh, well, I might go ahead and um, try playing much slower, like quarter notes at 190, and then a little burst of the eighth notes. So like this. You know, so I'm playing mostly half the tempo that I'm sticking at, and then I do little bursts of the fast notes. That technique can be really helpful, and then you can make the bursts a little longer. You know, if you do four notes and you're successful, then try a burst of eight eight notes. So, you know, if you're like, you're like, hey, I got the burst of four, then you could try a burst of eight. But going back to the half tempo notes uh, really sort of stabilizes you and you can compare how well you play the half tempo notes with how well you play the fast notes to kind of gauge if you're really getting it. So that's the second strategy. A third strategy, and this is a little bit outside the box, is actually to start um, way beyond your tempo and work your way back down. Uh, so let's say again, if I were sticking at 190, um, and again, I, I, would, I would use this approach with caution, I wouldn't overuse this one, but let's say I'm sticking at 190, then I might go directly to 240 or something. And then, you know, once I've played it a couple times there, sorry. Then once I've played it a couple times there, then I might come down to 220. And then I might come down to 200. And then I might come down to 190. So the risk of doing that is that you might get really sloppy uh, when you're doing it faster than you're really comfortable. But the benefit of that approach is that psychologically, now 190 feels slower in comparison with the faster tempo. Uh, but again, the first two approaches I said would be my core ones, practicing right under the sticking point and also doing those speed bursts. So Bluesy, that's a great question. If you have other questions, uh, feel free to drop those in the chat. And uh, I do appreciate you guys being here. I see uh, Johnny's guitar cover says, this is what I do most. Even if I fumble through the super fast tempo, it'll still help me think when I slow it down. So yeah, definitely that approach um, can be helpful to... Um, you know, to go faster and then kind of come back. So great, thank you for that. Um, another question that I got was priorities in practice and what's important. Uh, so when you're thinking about priorities in practice, um, I would definitely say uh, you want to think about, you know, kind of what are your long-term goals? You know, what are you really hoping uh, to achieve in your practice? Um, you know, are you hoping to be uh, at a very high level? Are you just uh, hoping to be able to play a few simple pieces for fun? Uh, that's going to partly determine your approach to your practice and what you prioritize. Um, but definitely one of the things to prioritize is enjoying making music. Regardless what your goals are, I think sometimes we can forget that music is supposed to be fun, we can make it work, and then when we make it work, we don't want to practice anymore. So I think it is important uh, to prioritize doing things you enjoy. Uh, if you're only practicing you know, 15 or 20 minutes a day, then uh, maybe you need to make sure you get to those things you enjoy in that 15 to 20 minutes. If you're practicing a longer time, like let's say you're playing a couple hours a day, then you may want to eat your broccoli first and do some you know, scales or exercises or things you don't enjoy as much early on, and then the things you enjoy do later on. Um, but I would definitely say uh, you want to prioritize doing things you enjoy, and then you want to prioritize things that are moving you toward your goals. So if your goal is to get a scale faster, then you know, spending some time really working on that. If your goal is to get a certain piece mastered, then really working on that piece in your practice session. I find it's good to have kind of a, a focus uh, item for the day. So, hey, there's this one piece that I'm really going to focus on today, and I might run through other pieces, but it's really this one piece that I'm going to try to make a lot better today. And then tomorrow, I might pick a different focus piece and try to make that piece better. So, um, I think having just that focus for your practice um, is really useful so you can 
go deep on that one piece uh, or that one passage for the day. Uh, so good question. As you have other questions, drop them in the chat. And uh, another question that I got in advance is, uh, what if I want to use an amplifier with my classical guitar? Uh, do I need to go um, and get somebody to modify my guitar to drill a hole in it or something like that uh, to use an amp when I practice? If I have a guitar that costs several thousand dollars, I might not want to poke a hole in it. Um, great questions. So yeah, there are different ways to go about amplifying the classical guitar. Uh, when I play um, classical guitar in a large space and I need to amplify, I just use a microphone, um, typically a condenser mic, um, but a microphone uh, in front of the guitar, you know, either in front of the bridge, in front of the sound hole, something like that. That's typically what I like to do when performing. Uh, now, if you really want to have a line output, uh, then you know certainly it is possible to drill into the guitar. If you have a high-end guitar, I, I agree with you. I'd be really um, sure that that's what I wanted before I drill into my several thousand dollar luthier built instrument. Um, you know, this is a Robert Ruck uh, luthier built instrument. I have not drilled a pickup into this. Uh, if I play this in a large space that needs amplification, I just use a microphone. But um, if you want to modify a guitar and, and have a line output installed, that's certainly possible. Another option is there are sound hole pickups, you know, pickups that you can slide into the sound hole and then have a line uh, from that uh, to an amplifier. So definitely different ways. And if you're playing in a noisy gig, you know, having the pickup is better than the mic uh, if you're in, you know, playing background music with a lot of people talking or something, because the mic will create feedback in that noisy environment. Uh, so I used to play restaurant gigs years ago, and for those it was really better to have the line output uh, rather than the mic. Uh, so good question about amplifying the classical guitar. Uh, WW says, hey there, how should I maintain my repertoire as a hobbyist? How often should I be playing the pieces and still be able to learn new stuff? Uh, good question. So if you're trying to maintain repertoire, you're trying to keep up pieces that you already know how to play, I find that you can touch them successively less often and sort of find out how often you need to touch them to still keep them up. So what I mean by that is, let's say that um, you have this piece just kind of mastered, well, try just playing through it one time a day and see if you still keep the quality up. Great. If, if you do, then maybe go to only playing that piece every other day. And then if you're still keeping the quality up, then maybe even try just a couple times a week, maybe go down to like once a week. Uh, I find if you go to less than once a week, it's really hard to keep up with it. But there are some pieces where if you just play through them once or twice a week, you'll be able to keep, uh, keep them under your fingers. So, uh, so I would say just try that sort of successive step down. So if you kind of keep a list of your repertoire, you can have pieces like, hey, this is a daily piece. I'm going to be going through this every day. Uh, these are a twice a week piece and these are a once a week piece. Um, and then obviously you have your new pieces that you're learning, which of course are gonna take more intense focus. Uh, so hopefully that helps uh, WW in keeping up your repertoire. And that's definitely something as you learn more pieces that you have to think about how to balance uh, those different pieces and, and keep up with your repertoire. Uh, so very good question. Um, another question that I got was, can you explain the term sticky fingers when relating to my left hand finger movements um, as opposed to flying fingers? Well, uh, sticky fingers is not a term I use a lot, but some people will use that term for when you're playing like an ascending scale, if you're leaving the fingers down on the string uh, as you ascend, then that would be sticky fingers. So, you know, as you play one, two, four on a string, if the one and two are left down, that's sticky fingers. Flying away fingers is, you know, if your fingers are lifting way out from the fingerboard. And you certainly never want to have the fingers flying away uh, from the fingerboard when you're playing. So I would ad advise you to keep the fingers close into the fingerboard. Whether you keep them down or not, I typically do keep them down when I ascend. But either way, uh, you don't want them flying away from the fingerboard. Uh, so good question. Again, if you have other questions, drop them in the chat. Um, if anything I'm talking about brings up a question, drop it in the chat. Uh, I definitely want to help you guys out. And um, one thing I do want to throw out there for you guys, uh, I appreciate you being here for my live stream. Uh, one of the things I've been uh, contemplating for the channel is just whether to focus more on videos I upload and um, sort of take a break from live streaming every single week. So I'd be interested in your thoughts in the chat of whether you really um, you know, are strongly interested in me live streaming every single week or if you would be happy with me putting more energy into the uploads uh, because you enjoy those videos that I pre-record and upload. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on that as I do just mull over what's gonna serve you guys the best. Um, so moving on to another topic I got in advance is playing legato versus playing staccato. 
Um, so when we talk about playing legato, it's connecting the sound. Now, confusingly, some people use the term legato for hammer-ons and pull-offs. Uh, but for now, for this moment, I'm not going to be uh, using this term legato for hammer-ons and pull-offs. I'm going to use legato for connecting the sound. Uh, so in other words, if I play from this C to this D, and I have a minimum break between the two notes, then that's legato. As opposed to, if I have a big break between the notes, that's staccato. So I'm going to play this C major scale legato. And then I'm going to play the C major scale staccato. So staccato is pretty easy to do on the guitar. The way we pluck the guitar just naturally results in staccato a lot of the time. What's harder to do is to play legato, to have just a smooth connection of the notes. And so when we want to produce legato, how do we do that? Uh, really, there's kind of three things that can interrupt the legato, if you think about it. One is you could put a right hand finger on the string too soon. So if I'm going from C to D, you know, then, um, putting that right hand finger down too soon creates the staccato. So if I don't want staccato, I gotta make sure not to put my right hand finger down too soon. Another thing that can create a staccato is if I'm putting the left hand finger down too soon. And so if I'm trying to create um, more legato, I've got to make sure to time when I put my left and right hand fingers down together. And then if I'm lifting off, uh, it can create staccato, you know, when I lift off um, too soon. So like that creates staccato. So I got to be sure not to lift off too soon. So um, really I need to synchronize my two hands and make sure that I'm plucking right as the next left hand finger is available um, on the string so that I create legato. So good question. So I see a couple things in the chat. WW says, I might be biased because it's usually 2 a.m. here when you're live streaming and I hardly get to watch your live streams, so videos would be better for me. So that's helpful. Well, thank you for being up at 2 a.m. to uh, watch this. I appreciate that. And uh, so that is good feedback for me to know, WW, that for you, uh, the videos that are uploaded are helpful. Um, Anthony says, I like the live stream more interactive and enjoy listening to you answer questions and demonstrating these. So Anthony speaking in favor of the live stream. So thank you for that. And uh, Skeet Joystick asks, what happened to the snazzy lights? Uh, well, I just don't have them set up today. So um, thank you for mentioning those. I've been thinking about setting them up again soon uh, for a video. And so you mentioning that you uh, miss them uh, certainly encourages me to, to set them up again uh, for a video very soon. So. Uh, Skeet, thank you for that. Uh, cool, so I'm gonna go to another uh, question that I got in advance, which is um, how should my thumb move in the right hand so any raspy sound is minimized? Uh, do I need to reposition my whole right hand uh, to pluck the bass th strings cleanly? And how does the thumb move when plucking the treble strings? So, uh, good question. So when you're plucking the bass strings, you get the kind of raspy sound. <laughs> Uh, if your fing if your thumb is you know scraping along the length of the string, so to avoid that, you want the contact point and the departure point of uh, your stroke to be the same. In other words, you want to contact and leave the string in one place rather than contacting the string here, sliding along the string and leaving over here. So um, try to make the contact point and departure point the same place to avoid scraping. I don't think that you need to worry about. Um, you know, changing your right hand position overall to avoid that scrape on the bases. You might need to, but for the most part, it should just be um, getting the contact point and the departure point the same. The other thing I will say is the actual angle of the thumbnail to the string is important. You want the thumbnail to be kind of parallel uh, to the string. In other words, if you put the thumbnail at a right angle to the string, you're going to get a lot of scraping, and so you want to have the nail parallel to the string. Um, as far as playing on the trebles, um, I find that playing with the thumb on the trebles is less common, but when you do it, I think making sure to get a combination of nail and flesh helps, otherwise you tend to get a very kind of bright tinny sound. You know, that's with no flesh, whereas if you get a little flesh in the tone with using thumb on the trebles, you'll get a warmer sound. So that's what I'd say as far as using uh, thumb on the trebles. Um, I see Bluesy Bluesman prefers live streaming. Well, thank you, Bluesy. Um, I appreciate all your 
good questions in the live streams and I'm glad that you enjoy them. Um, so appreciate that feedback. Um, so then another question that I got in advance was how long should my thumbnail be when playing the classical guitar? Uh, there are some on YouTube that I've seen that look like mini daggers. Um, so good question here. Yeah, I've known some people. I knew a guy years ago, a Brazilian guitarist who had this thumbnail that was like super, super long. Uh, for me, I go with about a quarter inch past the end of the fingertip. So I actually measure with a ruler and uh, I don't have my ruler on my music stand at the moment, but I, I take the ruler and I measure is my thumbnail coming a quarter of an inch past the end of the fingertip and that's how long I like my thumbnail to be. I don't find a necessity for it to be like a dagger for it to be one of those super long ones and uh, you know I'm not totally sure why some of those players do it. I asked the Brazilian player I used to know and he just said well it gives me a variety of how much nail I can get. Well with just a quarter inch of thumbnail I feel like I can get a variety of how much nail I get. I don't feel like I need you know an inch or something but uh, to each his own, if you like a really long thumbnail, more power to you, but uh, for me, a quarter inch past the end of the, the, the fingertip is plenty on the thumb. Um, and another question on the thumb or comment on the thumb, somebody said, Segovia's thumb was shaped like a banana. Do you think he had an advantage with a banana-shaped thumb? I don't think a banana-shaped thumb is necessarily an advantage, except for what I was talking about, about avoiding scraping on the bases, mm -hmm. and that is, you want to get the nail positioned along the string and so you know if your thumb maybe naturally curves um, you know in the opposite direction then you may be having a harder mm. time avoiding that scraping and you may have to reposition the right hand a little whereas if you have you know what he described as a banana shaped thumb mm. you may naturally get the thumb back where it doesn't mm. scrape on the bases um, so good question if you um, have questions please do drop those in the chat and again, sorry about my voice today, just uh, fighting a little congestion or something today. Um, another one was what about flat wound strings versus round wound? Uh, what are flat wound strings all about? Do they sound better than round wound? Will they last longer? Will they play louder? Will they make the left hand fingers more sore? Well, really the point of flat wound strings is to avoid scraping noises. So, you know, when you get this kind of scraping in the left hand, uh, that's very common on a normal round wound string. So the flat wound strings are supposed to create less of the squeaking uh, on the bases uh, when you shift. Um, I think sometimes the flat wound can be a little better in sound, but overall they're not that different as far as you know volume or as far as how they feel on the left hand or anything like that. But uh, definitely um, they do help reduce the squeaking. Another alternative to flat wound would be to go with a polished string. Polished strings also uh, help reduce the squeaking in the left hand. Uh, so very good. Other questions. Um, Another one that I got in advance was, do strings get dirty and does it matter if I use dirty strings? How about a dirty fretboard? Well, certainly uh, the strings in the fretboard can get dirty. Uh, the best thing I would suggest is just to wash your hands before you play guitar. Uh, you know, you definitely don't want to start playing guitar right after you just ate a hamburger and some french fries or something. You know, if your hands are covered with grease or something like that, uh, your strings in your fretboard can get pretty nasty. So I would say first thing is to wash your hands each time before you play uh, so you're not bringing, you know, food grease or something else onto your strings in your fretboard. But certainly you can clean your fretboard. Um, I use a cloth that looks like this. Uh, it's from Planet Waves and I use this to to clean both the main body of my guitar and also my fingerboard as well. And I have this um, oil, it's called fingerboard oil that I use to clean my fingerboard. I believe it's lemon oil is probably what it is, but uh, fingerboard oil that I use to clean my fingerboard. And then I have a separate uh, guitar polish from the Martin Company that I use to clean the body of my guitar. So, um, so yeah, I definitely encourage a cleaning cloth um, a lemon oil or something like that for the fretboard and then a guitar polish of some type for the rest of the body of the guitar. So a good question there. Um, <clears throat> and then another question that I got was uh, can frets wear down and flatten out to the point of being a problem when playing? And yes, it's totally possible that you can wear down the frets of the guitar, uh, especially, you know, just create kind of a groove where the string is over time as the guitar gets older and older. And so uh, periodically the guitar may need to be refretted. Uh, my guitar is a 1980 Robert Ruck. And so this, this guitar has been around for 40, almost 42 years now. 
And uh, so this guitar has been refretted once and uh, I'm thinking, and this, it was refretted maybe 15 years ago or something like that. Uh, actually, probably more than that, honestly. It was refretted before I got it um, and I've had it more than 15 years. So in any event, um, it's probably going to need refretted again at some point because the frets are getting a little worn down um, yet again. So that, yeah, it, you really need somebody who's a talented uh, and skilled guitar technician uh, to really do refretting. That's not something I would encourage the average person to do unless you really have an interest in uh, luthery and understanding how to build guitars and that sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, definitely the frets can get worn down and need to be refretted. Um, <clears throat> Bluesy Bluesman says, how can I understand if I'm talented on the guitar and how important is talent? Um, it's a good question, and there is a growing body of research that says that talent is overrated. And so, um, you know, a lot of times in our society we elevate talent, and I think there are a couple reasons for that. You know, it's just exciting to be able to say, hey, you know, that person is just so talented, that athlete, that musician, they're just so talented. You know, they just got up in the morning and were just able to play, you know, all this music flawlessly. They got up in the morning and they were able to, uh, you know, catch a football and run you know, so amazingly. But the thing that research shows is that top athletes, top musicians, you know, people who are at the top of any field spend hours and hours and hours in practice. And, you know, there's kind of the famous 10,000 hour rule that to be the best in the world, you know, you need at least 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. And there's been some debate about, uh, you know, that particular thing, the 10,000 hour rule. But in general, uh, if somebody is excellent in what they do, they have put in thousands and thousands of hours of practice. So I think that the deliberate practice, you know, carefully putting in work, noticing when it's not working, changing your approach, um, you know, continuing to improve over time, that's way more important than talent. Um, so, you know, how do you know if you're talented? Well, certainly I think talent is like, hey, I feel like I can pick this up easily. And I think you can certainly compare talent for one thing versus another. Um, so I, I would say I'm probably more talented on the guitar than the piano, but I've also spent so much more time with the guitar. So how much of that is really just the practice that I put in here? And if I put in the same practice on the piano, maybe I'd be equally good. So it's hard to fully know that. But in general, talent is, you know, kind of like, hey, I can look at picking this one thing up more quickly than this other thing. But in all areas, practice is much more important to success than uh, talent, I would say. Um, you know, a lot of times uh, practice and diligent work is 80% of success and talent's like 20% of success. So that would be my thought there. Um, I see that Gord says, uh, can I send a friend a piece of PDF music if I delete my own file after sending? He reads the PDF and then emails it back. Then he deletes his copy. No extra copies exist. Uh, it would be like lending a book and it gets returned. Uh, that's a great question, Gord, and you know, copyright law is just one of these crazy complicated things. I had this unsettling conversation with a copyright lawyer a few years ago at a conference. Um, I asked him, you know, what is uh, fair use? Um, there's this concept of fair use, like, you know, how much of a copyrighted work can you use uh, and it be considered fair use? And he said, oh, well, just use whatever it is and see if you get sued. And I, I was taken aback and he continued, and if you get sued, see if you went in court. And if you went in court, you'll know it was fair use. Well, that might be great if you're a lawyer and you make your living from having that court case. But for me, as a guitar teacher, that was very unsettling uh, to think about being sued over you know, using a piece of music and considering it fair use. So Gord, to your question, um, some of those things I think may be unclear in copyright law, but for me, I just go by kind of my own conscience. So I suppose for me, you know, sending a PDF to somebody, deleting it, and then they send it back, and then they delete it, that would be okay with my conscience. The only thing that might nag at my conscience is whether I know for sure that person will delete it. If I really trust that person and I believe they're not gonna keep a copy of it, then okay. Um, I certainly have dealt with this with my own guitar students where I will lend them a piece of music, and I don't necessarily know if they photocopy it or not. Uh, so it's kind of similar in that instance to your PDF example. Uh, if I lend a student uh, a piece of music and they photocopy it for their own use, they've broken copyright law. But um, so I just kind of go by, I ask the student, hey, if you borrow my music, please don't photocopy it and keep the copy for yourself. And uh, if my student comes back and says, hey, I have copied it, then I will say you need to destroy the copy because um, 
you haven't purchased the music. So yeah, I would say a lot of it's kind of being guided by conscience because copyright law is so complicated. Uh, good question. And uh, Rohit says how to play picado. And uh, picado is more of a flamenco technique, uh, so I don't uh, do a lot uh, with picado. So thank you for that question. And um, I, I would imagine there's a lot of good tutorials on YouTube for picado, but unfortunately that's not something I specialize in. Um, Rohit says my fingers are not straight enough to play fast. Um, now one of the things I will say, Rohit, there is uh, I don't think you need straight fingers to play fast. I think a lot of playing fast is efficiency of movement, using the minimum necessary movement, not necessarily having straight fingers per se. So I would encourage you in that. Um, I see Mark Lar 3 says, I noticed that Tosin Abasi uses a banana shaped thumb technique to get tone out of the upstroke uh, thumb technique he uses. And so yeah, with, with those thumb techniques, you know, again, like the piccato or whatever, it definitely is about getting the right angle of the thumb. I don't think it's so much about the banana shaped thumb versus straight thumb or you know straight finger or something like that. I think most people, you know, unless you have just an incredibly incredibly unusual hand, and I mean like you know gnarled and deformed by arthritis or something, but unless you have uh, an incredibly unusual hand, you can find a way to position your fingers for doing um, you know picado or rasciato or standard plucking or any of these types of techniques. Um, I think it's certainly possible uh, to do that. So good question, and uh, yeah, sorry on the picado thing. I'll have to uh, have to research that and try to have a little more um, answer for you on that. Then uh, another question that I got was, uh, have you ever tried playing a guitar with old-fashioned sheet gut strings? Uh, well, when I was in grad school, I remember uh, I had a committee of professors who were asking me questions for a comprehensive exam, and I made the statement that gut strings are more unreliable than nylon strings and they go out of tune quicker because that's what I had read about them. And the harpist uh, was very offended and she said, have you actually tried gut strings? And I said, no. And she said, well, I think gut strings are great. I use them on a few of the strings of my harp and they have a very sweet tone. Uh, well, still to this day, even after hearing the passion of that harp teacher, I must admit I have not tried uh, gut strings on my guitar. Um, I, I get it that they probably do have a sweeter tone. I just, you know, from what I've read, they're pretty unreliable. And uh, so I, I just stay with the nylon strings. But certainly there are players out there that are specialists in historical performance practice, trying to basically uh, duplicate the um, past practice uh, that was done, you know, three or 400 years ago. And so some of those players, they will use instruments that are replicas of that, uh, instruments of that time, and they'll use those gut strings. Uh, so good question. Uh, Bluesy Bluesman says, is playing the right thing over and over again the only way to, f uh, to fix false muscle memory? Is there a shortcut? And it's a good question. Unfortunately, I don't think there's a shortcut. Um, I do think that practicing more times correctly than incorrectly is the best way to fix um, an incorrect muscle memory. Uh, visualizing away from the instrument can also be helpful just to clarify, you know, can I see in my mind's eye what I'm supposed to do and then try it again on the guitar to see if I got it right. Um, that definitely helps. Um, and then as you're learning something new, avoiding the wrong muscle memory in the first place, that's the best thing. You know, I do look at it a little bit like math. So let's say, you know, if I have played the right thing five times and the wrong thing five times, then my subconscious nervous system will just at random pick the right or wrong way. You know, um, it's kind of learned to, to randomly select 50% of the time do it this way, 50% of the time do it that way. So mathematically, I'm gonna need to do it, you know, 80, 90% of the time correctly to really know that I can consistently do it correctly. So let's say that I've built up, you know, 30, 40, 50 times I've done it wrong. Well, now I need to do it like 100, 150 times right to erase those wrong repetitions, or maybe not erase, but to override in my subconscious uh, nervous system those wrong repetitions. So the, the sooner I can get it right when I first learn a new piece, and the more times I can get it right, the better off I will be. So uh, sometimes if you've got a piece where you've just been playing it wrong for years, it may be good to start a new piece and then try to set good habits uh, from the beginning, and then go back to that piece where you have the bad habits and see if you can 
uh, then make some progress. So hope that helps, but yeah, that's not an easy issue. I've certainly had that where I've played something wrong for a long time and then it becomes very difficult to fix. Absolutely. So if you have a question, drop it in the chat. And uh, another question that I got uh, in advance is if only one string breaks, does that mean I should be changing all six strings to keep the tone the same? Uh, or is that not a problem? Well, definitely I think if a string breaks, uh, it's probably best to change all the strings at once um, because otherwise you kind of get in this cycle where it's like, okay, I broke the fourth string um, and then like a week later, now let me change these others. And then, you know, a few weeks later, you're like, well, hey, the fourth string is not sounding that good. Maybe I should go ahead and change it. And, you know, so you're kind of off um, cycle with that one string. So I would say if you break a string, it's probably good to change all of them. I know that's more expensive. Um, thankfully, on classical, I find that strings don't break as often as on steel string acoustic. Um, but uh, if, if you do have that happen where a string breaks, I would generally just change them all at that point. Uh, so good question. Uh, another question is, um, <clears throat> when I look at a brand new bass string, why is one end of the bass string thin and floppy while the other end is fatter and more solid? And this is because the thin and floppy end of the bass string is the one that the uh, string maker wants you to put through the bridge. Now, uh, sometimes I've been a little bit of a rebel here, and I've actually put the thin and floppy one up here on the, uh, you know, the roller, um, and I have put the uh, thick end down here at the... Uh, bridge, just sometimes I feel like the thin and floppy end is, uh, you know, maybe more likely to come loose down here. But uh, the idea is the thin and floppy one is easier to manipulate. It, like They kind of thin out the windings and it's easier to put on the bridge. Uh, in more recent years, I've just sort of gone with the string maker's intent and I usually put the thin end uh, down here on the bridge. Uh, so good question. Mark Lara 3 says, one of my extra steel string guitars is missing the two middle strings and I have fun playing it as a challenge. Absolutely, yeah, you can certainly do that. You know, like what could I still play if I'm missing two strings? Um, that can be a creative uh, approach. And you know, in general, uh, sometimes we think, hey, to be creative, I need to have unlimited resources. Like, you know, I need to have 15 guitars and um, you know, hundreds of pieces of sheet music in order to be creative. Well, really, a lot of times it's the constraints that we operate in that challenge us to be creative. So, yeah, if I play a guitar that's missing two strings, how can I be creative with that? Um, I think that's a great uh, challenge, and sometimes we can be more creative in the face of a constraint like that. So, yeah, that's fun. I like that. Cool. Um, another comment that I got was, I hate putting on a new string when one breaks as it takes so long to wind it tightly around the peg. Do you have any shortcut for making this tedious winding job a bit easier? Uh, well, actually, I have a little crank uh, that you can put on here, a little peg winder crank, and they are, they're super cheap. They're like just a couple bucks, but you can get a little peg winder crank and you can basically turn the crank to take the string on and off, and that speeds it up a lot. Uh, recently, uh, somebody actually in the Smart Classical Guitar Facebook group uh, mentioned that they have a peg winder attachment to an electric drill where they use the electric drill to take the um, you know, string on and off. And I actually bought one of those attachments. I haven't tried it yet, but I'm looking forward to trying it where basically you connect this attachment to the electric drill, put the little attachment around your peg, and then you know, basically you have wound the string uh, on or off. So that's certainly something that I um, have tried. Um, <clears throat> another question that came up was uh, when I change to new strings, should I over tighten and stretch out the new string? And yeah, I totally do this. I find it to settle in quicker. Uh, when you put on a new string, if you stretch it around the 12th fret, you know, kind of in the middle of the string, that can help you to stretch it out. And I also will tune up. Now, you know, you don't want to tune too far because it would put a lot of stress on the string, but I'll tune like a half step up. So the E string is tuned up to an F, the A string is tuned up to an A sharp, that sort of thing. So tuning all the strings a half step up and then stretching them at the 12th fret, which is kind of half of the distance from the nut to the saddle, uh, that's a good way to get your new strings uh, to stretch in. Absolutely. Um, if you have questions, go ahead and drop those in the chat. Um, another question that I got was, uh, what is a raised fretboard all about? Um, so a raised fretboard just makes it easier to get in high positions. A lot of classical guitarists don't like to um, use a cutaway because it diminishes the vibrating body of the guitar. And so the raised fingerboard will just take this part of the fingerboard 
and it's a little bit elevated here and the guitar is very slightly thinner but not as much so as a cutaway but it's just slightly thinner this way so that it's easier to get up here to the higher positions uh, so that is certainly something that uh, some players like is having a raised fretboard another question i got was what's the difference between a cedar top and a spruce top guitar and um, you know, most people would stereotype that a spruce top guitar has a brighter tone and a cedar top guitar has a darker and warmer tone. And I would say in general, that's true. Uh, this is actually a spruce top guitar that I'm playing right now, this Robert Ruck. And um, I would say it has quite a warm tone, um, but that's a little bit unusual. Uh, a lot of spruce guitars will have a little bit of a brighter tone and the cedar tend to have a bit of a warmer tone. Uh, so good question there. If you have questions, please do drop them in the chat uh, or comments. Um, you know, for example, if there's a particular challenge you're having in your practice, uh, go ahead and drop that in the chat and uh, see if I have any suggestions for you. I'd love to do that. Uh, another one that I had in advance was I've seen a few classical guitars online with a seventh string added. What's the advantage of having a seventh string? Um, well, I mean, it just gives you that much more range. A lot of times the seventh string is uh, another fourth lower than the sixth string, and so it gives you additional low bass notes. Um, sometimes players will take that seventh string and just tune it to different notes open and just use it as an open bass um, rather than fretting it. But some players will fret a seven string, and you know, some people play even up to like 10 strings. Um, and so there's certainly a lot of different options out there, you know, seven string, eight string, 10 string. Um, and it's just, you know, to create more variety of the tone, uh, maybe just using the basses for open, but again, some players will even fret those extra basses and create more variety. I find the six string is certainly a sweet spot. You know, as we all know, the six string guitar is the most common, um, but certainly those seven string, eight string, and even 10 string, um, you know, have some really great players and, and they can create some really interesting sounds. Uh, so certainly some interesting instruments uh, to explore. Another question I got was, uh, what does setting up a guitar refer to? Well, setting up a guitar is basically setting up the strings and kind of the height of the strings uh, away from the fingerboard. And so typically, if you're not experienced with guitar building yourself, it's good to have a luthier or a guitar repair person who's experienced uh, to set up the kind of the height of the strings off the fingerboard and uh, to, you know, kind of balance two extremes. If the strings are too high off the fretboard, then it becomes difficult to play. If the strings are too low, then uh, you may get some buzzing. And so you wanna try to find, you know, what's gonna be that ideal, not too high, not too low, uh, where it sounds good, doesn't buzz, um, but it's also not super hard to play. Um, so that's the setup of the guitar. Another question that I got uh, was uh, looking at Baroque music for guitar, and there's uh, sometimes a little thin wavy line with a short line through it, and this is called a mordant, uh, often happens in Baroque music. How does a mordant work? And um, <clears throat> well, I will say there's a lot of different ornaments in Baroque music, but I'll just uh, kind of for sake of simplicity right now, I'll talk about trill and mordant. Uh, so typically a trill would often come from an upper note. So let's say you have an F sharp and a trill is indicated, then a trill would be like, you know, it would be going to the note above the current note and then kind of alternating back and forth rapidly between that upper note and the main note. A mordant on the other hand, uh, the most common type of mordant is to start on the main note and then go down to a note lower and then back to the main note. So like this. And uh, so um, that's, that's a mordant and then that's a trill. So again, there's a lot of different ornaments out there in Baroque music, uh, but those are two um, common types that you'll see in a lot of Baroque music. Uh, so good question. And then another question I got is, are there any software programs that write music scores as you play music on the guitar? Um, you certainly can play into um, some software, but um, I, I haven't personally tried this out a lot. Um, you know, actually playing the guitar live and having the, the music notated for you, so I don't know how well that works. Um, I know on Finale, you can play in using MIDI, um, and so using uh, a MIDI piano, or there are even MIDI guitars, uh, you can play into Finale, 
But if you have a traditional guitar, you know, playing in without MIDI uh, sometimes may create uh, more inaccuracies, as I understand. I haven't tried that. When I do music notation, I do it through Denali without trying to play into it with the guitar. Um, but I have heard there are ways to play and kind of have it translated to notation for you. But um, again, I, I haven't really tried that a lot. What I've heard is without a MIDI guitar, sometimes that may not work as well. Uh, so good question. I see that uh, Anthony says, I have a hard time keeping my left hand fingers perpendicular to the fretboard. They want to angle at times. Are there any exercises or tools to help get them aligned properly? Well, um, so I think basically it's, you know, the fingertips uh, that you want to have perpendicular to the fretboard. Um, you know, the, the overall fingers you want to have curved, but uh, the fingertip itself, uh, you want to make sure it's not lying down too flat. You do want to make sure it's fairly perpendicular to the fretboard. And so what I would say is just a really simple exercise, like a chromatic scale can be good. So in other words, like, you know, just doing one, two, three, four on every string, that can be a really good exercise. And on the third string, you're only gonna go to the third fret if you do that. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. But an exercise like that can be really good and just let you focus on, am I getting my left hand fingertips roughly perpendicular to the fretboard uh, while the rest of my finger is curved? Um, so I think that is an exercise I would suggest, Anthony, that would help with that. Uh, Mark Lar 3 says, trills are way easier on piano for me. It's easier for me to get a good tone out of hammer-ons than pull-offs. And yeah, I think getting a good tone with hammer-ons and pull-offs is definitely something that takes uh, some work to do. And so, you know, you, you have to kind of work on that. Just like you would work on tone with your right hand, you know, you can also you know, try to work on pull-offs and getting a good tone there. Um, and um, so um, that would be something that I would definitely uh, suggest just working on the tone. But also, I would say when you're working on a trill, uh, you can realize that a trill is going to happen very fast. And so therefore, uh, because of the speed of it, it um, may not be as noticeable if the tone is not great. Um, so that's that's a comfort, but still, I would try to get the hammer on and pull off tone uh, to work the best I can. So uh, good good point, uh, Mark Lar. Um, is th are there other questions that you guys have? Uh, again, I would encourage you to drop those in the chat. <clears throat> Another question I got in advance was: When you started your graduate work in classical guitar, did you have a choice of not going into the performance track, but instead focusing on pedagogy? Well, that's a good question. Um, definitely the degree I did in graduate school, both my bachelor's, master's, and doctorate, all my, all my degrees were in guitar performance, uh, not specifically guitar pedagogy. Uh, most of my career, I have done a lot of teaching. I've done performing too, uh, but I've done a lot of teaching. And what I found is most uh, guitarists that go into performance do end up teaching. Uh, so I had classwork in pedagogy in how to teach as part of my guitar performance degree, and I think that was helpful. Uh, but certainly uh, a lot of things about how to teach I've had to learn on my own even after graduate school. Um, so in some ways, I think it'd be great if university programs had more focus in teaching performance majors how to teach. Um, again, my program had some of that, but that's certainly something that a lot of performance uh, majors end up doing in their careers, teaching a lot. So uh, good question. I see um, Geza's also, hopefully I'm saying this correctly, could you talk about right hand positioning, please? Where does one rest one's forearm and what should the angle of the wrist be? Does one suspend your hand or can you rest your thumb on the sixth string? Um, so good question. So as far as right hand positioning, um, I would say straight wrist and curved fingers. And when I say straight wrist, what I mean is kind of straight across the top. In other words, like if you put a file across the back of your arm and wrist, uh, you want that uh, file to kind of rest flat there. So that's kind of a straight wrist and you want the fingers to be curved. Um, sometimes I've heard the analogy, like if you reach down, like you're gonna pick up a suitcase and bring your hand up, then you'll have kind of the right curvature, the way that you would put your hand around the suitcase handle. So curved fingers, um, 
And you know, when you put the hand on the guitar, uh, you said, you know, can I rest my thumb on the string? Certainly, I would start off uh, when I'm trying to get a good right hand position by actually resting all the fingers on the string. You know, put index, middle, and ring fingers on the treble strings, put thumb on one of the basses. Uh, so right now, I'm resting my thumb on the fifth string, my index, middle, and ring on the third, second, and first strings. And so then, when I play, you know, like if I'm playing PIMA, then I'm gonna, you know, pluck each one. And basically, uh, what I would do is like, let's say I'm playing thumb, index, middle, ring, or PIMA. If I play with thumb, I'm gonna get index, middle, and ring all planted on the string. And then as soon as ring plays, I'm gonna plant the thumb again. So generally at any point in time, like in an arpeggio, for example, I'm gonna have one of my right hand fingers on the string. And that really just helps with stability. It helps in preparing for that next uh, note and making sure that I'm ready to pluck it clearly. Um, so yeah, I would say whenever possible planting, there are certainly contexts where all my fingers are off the string, uh, but when possible, I do like to rest one of my fingers on the string. If I'm playing a scale just with index and middle, I usually am resting my thumb on one of the bases. My thumb kind of follows along. You know, as my um, fingers go to a new string, my thumb moves. So for example, if I'm playing rest stroke scale, I may start with my thumb on the sixth string. By the time I get to the third string, I go ahead and move my thumb to the fifth string. Then when I get to the second string, I move my thumb to the fourth string. When I get to the first string, I move my thumb to the third string. So roughly when I'm playing rest stroke, my thumb is two strings behind uh, where the fingers are, um, just to provide, again, stability uh, for my right hand. And I see Anthony says, to piggyback on Gaze's question, what are your thoughts on a guitar armrest? I think they're a great idea. I don't have one, uh, but I've seen a lot of players that have a guitar where actually the luthier has built an armrest into the guitar, uh, you know, more rounded. Or I also have seen uh, armrests you can buy that use suction cup onto the top here. But I think having an armrest is a great thing. Uh, one of the things that I think I've mentioned in one of my streams before, but I actually wear a pad under my uh, shirt sleeve on my right arm uh, to make it more comfortable for my right arm. And I started doing this actually when I was in graduate school because um, I got severe tendonitis and it was really painful uh, to have the pressure of the corner of the guitar on my forearm because my tendons were inflamed and they were hurting. And I think actually the corner of the guitar uh, made my tendonitis worse. Uh, so for that reason, kind of ever since then, I have been wearing a pad on my right arm. So the armrest would be another option. Uh, but yeah, I think having a pad that you wear on your right arm or having an armrest just takes some of the pressure of the tendons pressing against the corner of the edge of the guitar. And I think that's a really positive thing. Absolutely. Um, any other questions? I've just got a couple minutes left. Uh, so if there's any other questions, I'd love to answer them for you um, before I do wrap up. Oh, I'll, I'll go ahead and just talk for another moment about the positioning question from Gazes. And, um, you know, when you're thinking about the right hand position, I find that some players uh, have some really bad habits of their right hand position. Uh, whether that comes from playing steel string or electric in a different position that doesn't work well for classical or whatever. And so I would say you want to be very patient and intentional in setting good habits with your right hand positioning. Uh, so if you're used to, let's say, having your right hand wrist down on the bridge or whatever for pick playing, uh, you're going to have to be intentional in getting a good right hand wrist position where the guitar is positioned away from the, uh, I mean, where the wrist is positioned away from the guitar and you've got that good uh, right hand curvature. And uh, Gord says, after listening to you, I think I'll go and practice on my guitar after I shovel all the snow. Uh, and Gord is in Canada. So yeah, I know that those in Canada and Boston and a lot of other places got a lot of snow. Uh, we didn't get very much here in Virginia where I live. We got, you know, maybe a half inch or something. But yeah, if you got a lot of snow, I understand that shoveling, it's a necessity. Uh, but I'm glad to hear that this stream is uh, encouraging to you uh, to want to go and play your guitar. And uh, you know, one of the reasons I end most of my videos by saying keep making music is my hope is that any of my live streams and my videos that I post are encouraging to you um, to want to keep playing the guitar, to want to keep making music. So thank you guys so much for tuning in today. 
And um, I would encourage you to uh, get a good right-hand position over the subscribe button and subscribe if you haven't already done so. And I really appreciate you taking the time out uh, to tune in for the live stream. As I mentioned earlier, I'm continuing to think about, you know, do I wanna keep doing a live stream every single week or do I wanna focus more on the video uploads that I do because I know a lot of people watch those. And so, um, you know, I appreciate input from you as the viewers. Uh, on you know how much you want me to live stream versus how much you want me to focus on uh, creating new videos to upload. But either way, I want to create things that are of value for you guys, and uh, I encourage you to keep making music. Take care.